Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today, one of my favorite guests, Richard D. Wolf, spelled W-O-L-F-F, one of my favorite authors. Um, welcome, to, welcome back. Thank you, Lorene. I'm glad to be here. Well, you are Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, visiting professor in the Graduate Program in International Affairs at the New School University in New York City. But as a writer and as a television personality, you've been on Charlie Rose, Bill Maher, Amy Goodman, of course. Uh, Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers. Oh, you do wonders with Bill Moyers. He has you back like I do. Yes. Because you are so, I, I've never gotten more response than from some of your other shows. So let's go for it. Your books. This is the one that got me. Capitalism Hits the Fan. People think that you're an economist, that economics is dry, not at all. The subtitle, The Global Economic Meltdown and What to Do About It. Another book you have with David Barsamian is called Occupy the Economy. And your new book, which we'll talk about in our next show, Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism. Capitalism hits the fan. What do you mean? Well, I think we're in the middle and still very much in the middle of the second worst breakdown of capitalism in the modern era, world history. You know, that was the horrible one back in the 1930s, what we call the Great Depression. And now here we are, having thought that we learned the lessons from the last one, so we wouldn't have to experience this again, discovering, well, either we didn't learn the lessons or we didn't want to do what those lessons taught us. And we're in another one, and it's uh, now the seventh year this started in 2007. We're in 2014, and there's no end in sight for there's the majority no of people. There's no recovery. They right. every there's some little statistic, and they think the recovery has begun. Well, there has been a recovery for those at the top. <laughs> if you're a corporate executive, if you have a lot of shares of stock, I mean, you know, loads, then you've recovered. But for the vast majority of the American people, no, there's no recovery, and the statistics are unequivocal about that. Well, um, a little history lesson for us, because the first collapse of capitalism in the United States was the Great Depression, and a lot of PBS TV watchers have basked in this beautiful Ken Burns, Paul Barnes production of The Roosevelt's An Intimate History. So what happened then? What did Franklin Delano Roosevelt do then that... that, that assuaged the pain and the, the, the horror of the Depression and that economic meltdown. He really behaved in a way that is radically different from what's going on now, and that it even demonstrates that the arguments made today against doing the kinds of things he did uh, as being unfeasible, unworkable, dangerous, the real story of the years of Roosevelt are proof of the opposite. Let me explain. The Great Depression was worse than what we have now, at least what we have up until now. Unemployment in 1933, officially 25%. Mm. That's four times what it is today. Uh, the country in desperate shape. Production cut back drastically. Real poverty across America for millions of people. Uh, loss of homes, foreclosure, all of it. Only much worse than today. And it meant that every level of government, local, state, federal, had no money because unemployed people can't pay taxes, etc. And yet, what happened? Well, what is nowadays thought of as unthinkable happened. In the midst of the Great Depression, the president then of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, decided to do the following things. First, he created the social security system. We never had that in America before. He basically got up in front of the American people and he said, everybody over 65 was given a lifetime of work to our culture. I'm going to give you a check every month for the rest of your life. 
No sooner was the ink dry on that than he announced the unemployment compensation system. If you lose a job because the economy's bad, not throughout any fault of your own, I, the president, will give you an unemployment check every week for a couple of years to help you through this difficulty. Before the ink was dry on that, the next thing, the first minimum wage. You know how we're debating minimum wages in America today? That was the first federal minimum wage passed at the depths of a depression by a president who would not be deterred by arguments that that not, might, might not be good for some poor kids who wouldn't keep a job. And then the biggest one. He went on the radio and he said, if the private sector of American business is either unwilling or unable to give work to the tens of millions of Americans who ask for nothing more than a chance to have a decent job, then there's no alternative but for me as president to do it. So he created and filled 15 million jobs. Okay, that's stunning. That's a president who really, in the midst of a depression, did what you would hope a compassionate government could do, which is help people, help them rich and poor, white and black, across the country. So let's examine, why did that happen? Two things. One, there was an uprising from below. More people joined trade unions in the 1930s, in the depths of the Depression, than had ever joined unions in American history. We've never had anything like it before. We've never had anything like it since. Millions of people who came from families where no one had ever been in a union joined the union, and they did it for a very honest reason. They thought they would better get through this awful depression in a union than if they were not in one. And we also had millions of Americans joining socialist and communist parties in this country, something that is historically not too well remembered but ought to have been. The socialists and communists together with the unions, and they were organized in something called the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, they went to Roosevelt. And they said, look, Mr. Roosevelt, you've got to do something to help the millions of people in this country that are suffering through a depression they did not cause and of which they have already been for enough years victims. But they also had a little threat in the back. They said quietly and politely, Mr. President, if you don't, then we can't be responsible for what Mm. happens next because you might have something in this country that looks a little scarily like what they did in Russia not so many years before. Roosevelt was a sharp politician. He went to the wealthy and he went to the corporate leaders of America and he told them what had been done. And he advised them, you've got to give me the money. I'm going to have to tax you to raise the money to pay for Social Security, unemployment compensation, and hiring millions of workers. Half of them were never persuaded. Half of the leaders of business and the wealthy, but the other half were. And partly out of compassion, but partly out of fear of what might happen if they said no. So guess what? Roosevelt taxed the rich in America and the corporations to get the money to create Social Security, unemployment, and all the rest. Last point. People said then, as they say today, that any politician who dared to take money from the rich to help the middle and the poor would be committing political suicide. But what's the reality? Roosevelt is the most popular president America ever had. He was reelected four consecutive times, something that no other president in American history ever came close to. So bad was it that immediately after he died, the Republicans pushed through a law that no president can have more than two terms, which is why we have that law today. So the the statement that the American people would not reward politically someone who took tax the rich and corporations and used it to help the mass of people is simply wrong. It reflects your not knowing your own history as an American. And I think if this can be conveyed, in part at least, by this new series, it will be an enormous service because it will give Americans a sense of what was done and therefore what could be done again and lead them to ask the important question, why isn't it happening now? And why isn't it happening now? Well, I think the crucial difference is we don't have a movement from below. Our unions are not in an upsurge. They're in a period of decline. We eradicated the socialist and communist parties after World War II. They barely exist and have no significant influence. So we don't have any of the organized 
mechanisms that might marshal the feelings of people so that they make a political difference in the state house and in the federal government. And so we see a government that can pretend as if this history of Roosevelt, which is only a few decades ago, never happened. We have a country now that doesn't even debate the question of a federal jobs program. I mean, it's not that we don't do it. That's bad enough. We don't but talk we don't about discuss it. about it. You know, one or two members of Congress occasionally propose a bill that has a little of it in there, and that bill is silenced and buried somewhere along the way. And for the people as a whole, it's as if we have a collective amnesia about what we did last time that would have helped so many more people if it were done again today. Well, um you know, there were there were mumblings at the beginning of the 2007 recession that say, well, we need infrastructure. Let's let the government hire people like the Civilian Conservation Corps exactly. that, that Roosevelt did and at least fix the roads and the bridges. This is something we know has to be done. We'll pay them. There are all these unemployed people. And that went nowhere. Now, the old line that man learns from history that he does not learn from history is way too painful for us now, you're right, this was what, not, it wasn't that long ago, there are people alive, uh, powerful people now who remember having been through the Roosevelt years. Not only that, if you ever get a history book, you cannot drive across the United States without passing through state parks, national parks, roadway systems, whole valleys that were built by these people who got jobs from the federal government. Yeah. Many Americans take their families for a trip to the parks in the summertime when the weather's good to enjoy nature, to enjoy uh, what you can have in this. But many of those parks were built by these unemployed people who, and, and now let's think about it. We now leave millions of people on the dole. Every week they get a check. They don't feel very good about themselves. They're not working. They don't get the respect of other people that they had when they had a job. They lose contact with the skills they once had. They lose contact with their employers, and they feel bad about themselves, and they're probably not a great joy for the others in their family and circle. The alternative would be give them a job. Yeah. If you gave them a job, that all those bad consequences wouldn't follow. They'd feel good about themselves. They would then have the money to keep their home from foreclosure. They would then be able to help their kids get the college education we say as a nation we believe in. What are we doing not doing something that worked as well as it did in the 1930s? Why aren't we even discussing it? Maybe we can argue about how big it should be and how long it should last. But the fact that we don't deal with it at all suggests a kind of bad conscience governing the need to Mm -hmm. keep it as though these things never happened. Well, Gore Vidal called us the United States of Amnesia. And and I think there is an an element of that. You mentioned that at at the time, uh, one of the pressures on Roosevelt were, were these groups, the IWW and the communists and the, the socialist CIO groups. Advanced. And you say that there hasn't been much movements like that. But your second book that I want to talk about, Occupy the Economy, talk about what that movement was because it was really a hybrid, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah, I think the Occupy Wall Street movement is a great historical watershed because I think it represents really the first time since the end of the war, World War II since the destruction of the socialists and communists, that Americans finally said, look, for 50 years it's been taboo to talk critically about capitalism as our economic system. We're not going to abide by the taboo. We're going to start talking about it. And they chose this wonderful phrase, the 99% versus the 1%. And they put that on the map of America's consciousness. It became something headline writers could use. It became, yeah. it became part of speeches President Obama gave and so on. It, it means that Americans come to terms with a reality that's been building for decades, that if you leave capitalism to work its own way, what it produces is a polarity of a relatively small minority of really rich institutions and people at one end, and a mass of people who find it hard to get the basic needs of life, let alone the vaunted American dream, uh, bring it into within reach. And I think Americans are upset about it. 
they feel deprived about it, resentful about it, and Occupy is the first of what I think will be many beginnings of producing now, slowly and hesitantly, what was done so much more quickly and effectively back in the 1930s. Well, we're speaking today with Richard Wolff, and you are called a Marxist economist. And that, that used to be, um, you know, you mentioned Marxism because, again, we've an annihilated all communists, and so th th that would be a, a bugaboo, and people would stay away. But you have some very interesting points of view, and you say it's almost childish not to look at what's really happening to this one system. The world has not always operated on on capitalism. You, you've, you've mentioned this great line that we're used to capitalism bringing us the goods, but now capitalism is bringing us the bads. You can't give us a history of capitalism, but say there's a 250-year arc of things going up, and now perhaps it's They're going down. I think the, the metaphor I found most effective is this. Suppose you wanted to understand the family that lived up the street from you. Mama, Papa, two kids. And you began to do some inquiry because you're really interested in the family. And you discovered that one of the two children praises the day they were born. They're so lucky to be born in this family. They've been nurtured. And, and, and just it's, they love it. Whereas you discover that the other child thinks they were born into some TV drama of the dysfunctional <laughs> family, that they all have psychological problems that they need desperately to cope with, etc. Putting aside, you know, the fact that this is actually not at all an unusual situation, most of us have in our circle of friends a family not so different, right? If you wanted to understand the family, what would you do? Would you talk to only one of the two children? I think most reasonable people would say right off the bat, no. You wouldn't talk to either the one or the other. What you would do is talk to both of them, weigh what they have to say, reach your own conclusion, but that not to expose yourself to either of them and only to one isn't science, isn't reasonable, isn't going to get you very far. It's going to give you a very lopsided understanding. So here I am, uh, a professional economist all my life. I went to the excuse me, the best universities America has to offer, at least that's what say. Harvard, Stanford, Yale. And those are the only schools I ever attended. I was never given a critic of capitalism's work to read. And the most important of those still is Karl Marx. I should have been given a chance to read all the people who think capitalism is wonderful. That's fine. I have nothing against being given those people to study. But I also should have been given to study the people who think capitalism isn't so good and that we could do better. And then I should, like every other student, make up my mind and take a position. I grew up in an America that was afraid, because there's no other word for that, to give me that opportunity. They, they deprived my education. I only learned from people who thought capitalism was wonderful. So did my generation. And that meant we weren't ready for this crisis because it wasn't supposed to happen. And we're not very good at getting us out of this crisis because we didn't study crises because we had convinced ourselves we were in a system that was always upward and onward and was not liable to have this kind of breakdown. So I think it's come back to haunt us as a nation that we lack the courage to balance the celebratory view of capitalism with the critical view. Well, the other metaphor for this kind of exponential, ever-expanding growth is cancer. Yes. <laughs> There's only one thing that keeps on growing and growing and growing without end, and that is not a good thing. That is cancer. So talk to me about that. What <clears throat> One of the greatest criticisms Marx had was precisely this point. That's why, why you ought to read him in a, in a properly balanced curriculum. Marx's argument was, look, every individual capitalist is caught up in competition. He or she is always worried that another company is going to develop a new way of doing this or a cheaper way of doing this or a new product is going to come along that everybody is going to want instead of whatever it is I produce. So every capitalist is always kind of, you know, looking over his or her shoulder worrying about competition. And one of the ways you handle that is to grow. Because the bigger you are, the more profit you get. 
And the more profit you get, the better your chance of surviving a competitive challenge. If somebody else comes up with a new machine, well, if you have enough profit in your business, you could buy a, one of those machines too. If someone else comes up with a new product, well, then you'll have enough profit to go into that business. Profit is your survival. And the best way to have more profit is to grow your business. You don't worry if you're using up the resources of the planet or if you're polluting everything in sight or if you're you know, making the lives of your workers very unpleasant because in your mind, your survival is at stake. And so capitalism has this, as you put it, cancerous growth imperative that drives it and now we're seeing, particularly in the climate change and other kinds of movements, we're seeing yet another example that this kind of hysterical, out-of-control growth for its own sake, this product of a capitalist system, defies rationality when it becomes clear that there are good reasons not to grow quickly, but to grow in very particular ways at, at chosen rates so that we hold on to the environment we depend on in the end. Right, because sustainability is an issue. If yeah. we consume every natural resource, if we pollute our oceans, if we you know, crush the worker down, take all the jobs away, um, What's the point? What, well, let me give what's you, left? Let me give you the best example I know of these days. Starting 30, 40 years ago, American manufacturers of clothing, appliances, furniture, all kinds of things, started leaving the United States, and they typically went to China and places far away. Okay, let's look at that. Why did they go? Because the wages in those countries are very, very s small, much lower than the United States. I mean, five times lower, ten times lower which means that an, um, an employer can get a worker to work the eight hours for a fraction of what it would cost if that, if that company stayed in Ohio or Pennsylvania or California. So they leave. They leave because it's good for their profits. Okay, now let's examine. When you produce shirts in China rather than in six factories around the United States, to get them from where they're produced in China into the stores where Americans will buy them requires tremendous train transportation, then ocean transportation, then truck transportation. That uses up oodles of energy, polluting the air with the result of burning gasoline. It dumps God knows how many uh, refuse piles of freighters into the ocean, damaging it. The effect on the environment, driven by the profit motive that got this to happen, not to speak of all the lost jobs in this country, but we're, we're acting as though polluting the oceans and polluting the air and using up the fossil fuels doesn't matter, doesn't count, as if what counts is only the profit calculations of the businesses who made the decision to go there. This is not rational anymore. And when you have an economic system that keeps producing in people behavior that we can see isn't rational, then it's time to question that system. Mm. Mm. Well... In uh, you know the, the contrast is the the trickle up when Roosevelt invested in the people it the prosperity trickled up and now we're in this trickle down and we've learned long ago that nothing is trickling down. Right. When I watched in the f last four months of 2008 when the crisis was really at its peak, and also in 2009 and 10, the trillions of dollars made available to our biggest banks by the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. The hundreds of, mil of billions of dollars made available to corporations like General Motors and AIG uh, by the federal government. I was looking at trickle down. You're going to help those at the top, and we're all supposed to wait for the goodies to trickle yeah. down to the rest of us, yeah. which they never did. And I was always of the opinion, look, even if trickle up, that is helping people at the bottom, the way Roosevelt did so much of that, even if it doesn't trickle up as well as you thought, you still would have helped the mass of people at the bottom, the elderly, the unemployed, and that would have been a good result. You can walk away now only by saying, I bailed out the big banks, I bailed out the big insurance companies, I bailed out General Motors. And that means you left behind the mass of the American people, and the people who got bailed out 
were the ones most responsible for bringing us the crisis from which we bailed them out. There's something fundamentally wrong with a system about which I can say what I just said. And Al Sharpton puts it this way. It's like you have a huge party. Everybody just just spends everything. And then you send the bill to the people who didn't go to the party. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. So the, indeed, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. But my quick question is, we've only got two minutes left, is, is your question is, is this the best we can do? And how do we go from where we are now to the vision that you have, which we'll continue in another interview, but to that vision of, of doing better with our economy? Well, the fact of the matter is, here in the United States after World War II, it became impossible to be critical of capitalism and to explore alternatives because it was branded as some sort of disloyalty to America rather than the commitment of people who thought we could do better and wanted to do better for their country called America, right? We are now coming out of that 50-year taboo, and I think that's the first step. It's a little bit like what AA teaches people. The first step is to come in there and say, okay, I have a problem. I'm an alcoholic, but I'm committed to getting out of that situation. We as a nation have to say, okay, I have observed an absurd taboo. I have hurt this country by not asking what are the strengths and weaknesses of capitalism and comparing them to to alternatives to see whether we could do better. But I understand why that happened. I'm putting that behind me, and now I'm going to look at the alternatives that have always been there and to begin the conversation about whether some or all of them ought to be adopted and some or all of capitalism ought to be put behind us. If we can make that commitment now, we are well on the way to curing our problems and way ahead of where we've been in the last 50 years when we were afraid ever to think critically about the system uh, that gives us the goods and services we depend on. So the individual then, you know, they say be sure to vote. It's, it's way deeper than that. Yeah. yeah. Voting, can... voting is, in a sense, the end of the process. Yeah. You have to have the right thing to vote for. How many of us go to the polls if we even bother? Those of us who don't go say, you know, what difference does it make? And those of us who go, go there because we think it's our civic duty, but we really don't have anything like the range of choice that a country that prides itself on freedom of choice you'd (laughs) think would have given itself. We have two parties who half the time look indistinguishable from one another, and we poo-poo the countries that give real choice by having a range of... I think all of that is coming in the United States. And people who doubt it, they doubted the possibility of Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street showed that the pressure is building and the people are there. It's just waiting for that little moment when it can all come into view. We're out of time. Out of time. I want to show this your book, Occupy the Economy. People who've had their interest piqued will love reading this. The first one, Capitalism Hits the Fan. Our guest today is Richard Wolf. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lorene. It's always good having these conversations with you. It is. And I'm Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today and report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.